everyone, and welcome to our Tips for Better Garment Construction webinar. We're so excited to have you tuning in with us. I'd like to introduce our presenter for today, Bernina Educator Sylvain Bergeron. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am a garment maker from the start. I quilt nowadays, but I started with garment construction, actually. So today, I want to give you some tips along the way, kind of a checklist. And if you look at your little control panel, there's a handout, a PDF that you can download. There's links in there also to additional resources. And I will show you what's in the links so that you'll have a good idea. When I started, I started uh, sewing. And when I, about three years later, I submitted a project to Bernina and they brought me in for interview. This is the shirt I wore in 1996 for the interview. Remember the Seinfeld period, the big giant shirts, you know, the 90s? So that was it. So this shirt, uh, you know, got noticed by the person interviewing me. That was Susan Beck, actually, who is the author of the Big Book of Feet. And we talked about it. This shirt cost me $4 to make. The secret ingredient is I had a good machine. It didn't matter how much I paid for the fabric. The machine could execute everything. So today we're going to give you tips to get the best out of your machine and accessories so that you can benefit from it in garment construction. We are not making a gar we're not making a garment today <laughs> in 30 minutes that would not be fair but it's a checklist if you are a seasoned garment maker chances are this is all review and you're going to go yeah yeah i got it okay i didn't learn anything that means you got everything ready to go so good for you hopefully for most of you there'll be tidbits you can pick up here and there so looking at the slides here uh, I came to garment sewing. I'm an agronomist by training. I could draw a field drainage plan. I had to balance rations for cattle. I did uh, vegetable crop production. Yeah, I'm an agronomist. And I went to grad school as a plant disease epidemiologist. And I came up, I ended up at Bernina. Actually, the ticket there was that I submitted a project way back in 95, 96. That was what equivalent to what became features the Press of Feet book, the, origin, the original version before the Big Book of Feet. Uh, they brought me in for interview because they had already started. Bernina had started on that project six months before, but what I described was verbatim what they were working on. So they thought he's under something. I was brought in as a webmaster actually because I was teaching people at Cornell how to build websites. So I came from ag school. I was self-taught sewer. I did not know nothing when I started. And my first sewing machine was a $15 garage sale plunker. It was, it sewed. That's about it. It could not do a buttonhole if your life depended on it. It was, it was really a crude machine, but that's what I could afford as a grad student, right? And I started with garment construction because for men in the 90s, there was very limited styles and I was tired of having to fix garments. So I said, might as well make them. So I started making shirts. And I took a pattern drafting class. If you can take a pattern drafting class, if you make garments, it will help you. Uh, it will help you in construction sequence. It will help you in how to press. I learned to press a shirt, to iron a shirt when I learned to make a shirt. So it's very good for that. And of course, then you can start to play with it. And it will help you identify when you make your muslin, your default pattern to your body in a drafting class, it will help you identify where your fit questions and issues are and how to address them with the muslin. Best thing I ever did. So I graduated in 1993, the hundred year anniversary of uh, the, the mother company of Bernina by getting a, by buying a Bernina 1090. I tried every brand first. And the last one to, tr to try was Bernina because I thought this is the one to beat even on paper, but I wasn't sure. So I kept it for last. And when I sat down and I made a buttonhole with the automatic foot, it was Bingo, what well, a semi-automatic at that point, but still the way the precision was, I realized right away. So I was sold. So that was my first baby and I've never looked back. I've upgraded it two years later. I traded it in for a used 1230 because that had a fully automatic buttonhole since I did shirts. I would program the first one and then run the buttonholes. And actually, if you make shirts, there's a little trick for you. Notice that the, la the first button is right below the color stand. I do not do colors when I make a shirt. I like a plain stand. I do not wear ties. I have not worn a tie in 40 years. But this way, this is comfortable. I have a low Adam's apple. If the button is on the stand, it's like somebody's jabbing me in the throat all day, even if it's fitted. So I put the last, the first button right below that. That lets the stand flex as you wear the shirt. 
That way it's comfortable and stylish and you don't have to wear a tie. I call it my tie proof design. So I was all ready to go. I still have a 1260 QPE today that I, you know, I sold my 1230, got a 1260 QPE because I had more quilting stitches. And never, uh, you know, once in a while I'll take it out just like driving the old car from the garage. But uh, of course today I work mostly with touchscreen machines because that's easier. So uh, moving on, as I said, we are not making a garment today, but we are going to go through a series of tips from the equipment you need, the, the key presser feet that I use when I make garments. It won't cover everything, but it will get you uh, a good orientation. So uh, I was going to write tip number one. Uh, I changed that to rule number one. I've always driven small cars, like a tiny uh, Toyota Corolla type thing, and they don't have much power, so I have a heavy foot. I can't help it. So all my machines today, that little speed slider is the best. I bring it down to about half usually, sometimes less than that if I'm doing top stitching and finishing work, like you know appearance work, then I will slow it down even. So I don't sew, I slow. It sounds like slew, but it's I slow. Uh, otherwise, um, my foot is heavy. So, and one thing people don't realize, when you sew fast, you are not just going fast. The faster you, slow, you sew, the harder that needle is hitting that fabric. So if you have a very delicate fabric, you're likely to pull runs in it and to pucker it down. So if you want to sew fast, like on an industrial type machine, like say you have an 880, I have one from work to work on. If you want to sew at the 1200 stitches a minute, use a straight stitch plate and use a straight stitch foot. That controls the fabric so closely to the needle that it doesn't have a chance to do this when you hit it hard. But speed kills so i've learned the discipline and i've get i get better results when i slow down so my, you know my mother told me that and for once i listened to my mama all right so your machine may have a different speed control nowadays it's this uh, slider that you see on the left here the older machines that introduced that had um like they are the older touchscreen for instance like artistas had a m motor function and it started m you know half and then uh it, it they added like thirds in there so that gives you variety and on the original electronic machines like the 1130 in 1986 the 1230 all the way through the uh the 1260 basically they had a little diode with a button below it that would basically cut their speed in half that's when i learned to use half speed going on tip number two let your machine work for you you don't want, as I say, you have the best feed dog in the industry. The machine will deliver the precision. It will do exactly what you ask it to do. Work with it. That's not always easy. Uh, I had picked up some bad habits from my old plunker because I had to kind of overcompensate to guide the fabric because that machine had lousy feed dogs. So I had to unlearn that. And my mother, in her wisdom, when I, got, I gave her a Bernina when she was 71. And two weeks later, after training, you know, giving her a guide class, and I, I called her back. I'd come back to the U.S. She's in Canada, and I said, "So, how's the new machine? Was it hard to learn?" She said, "Oh no, what was hard it was unlearning the old machine." So for me, the same thing happened. So learn to work with your machine. First thing, the free hand system. You know the knee bar. Uh, let's do a little poll. Uh, so we now have a little poll. I want to ask you, do you use yours, yes or no? And since it's private, you know, it's it's anonymous, be honest. I just want, I'm just curious to see how many of you use it, how many of you don't. You can tell that I use it. The thing with the freehand system, if you ask people to use it, if you ask them, would you ever be without it? They will, they, first they will look scared and they will tell you no way. They would never be without it. Now, if you don't use it, if I can talk until you're blue in the ears, like how good it is, you don't know how good it is. But let me give you one, in, one indication. The factory in Switzerland did a study and they, uh, they had a company come in, do an audit. They put people to sew on specific tasks. They don't know why they're sewing, some with a freehand system, some without. The freehand system will save you up to 20% of your sewing time. It will hold the fabric for you when you start so that you can put the needle exactly where you wanted it. So the poll results, uh, Megan, just so you know, I don't see the poll results. So if you want to read me, read them to me. Sure. Uh, we had 60% say that they do use the freehand system and 40% say that they don't. Oh, we got to work on that. <laughs> and now for those of you who use your freehand system, are you ready? You're supposed to sew with your foot control on the left foot. 
and I'll show you a link later. It's in the uh, there's a link to the foot control on We Also. It's in the handout that you can download, so you'll see why because it separates the two legs. So uh, we'll see more of that later. The dual feed. If your machine is a, a, a new five series and up you have dual feed. Dual feed is like, you know, all wheel drive on a car. You don't need it all the time, but it really, really, really helps when you have multi-layered or changing layers from whether it's binding a quilt or you know working on the top stitch or the edge stitch at the edge of a placket. It, it really helps. So I use mine all the time. And dual feed combined with the freehand system is like that added touch of efficiency for your machine. The temporary altered stitch memory. I just did a video on Facebook a week or so ago, two ago, on the temporary altered stitch memory. The nice thing is that if you do a, a, a edge stitch for your plaquettes and you want to use the same thing around the collar, around the cuffs, the, uh, if you go back to that stitch, it will remember how you last used it. And you can actually save it in your personal program. And that we've had on all machines pretty much since 1998. So it's the Artista 180. So. You can actually use that. Uh, the needle down function, you, I'm sure you use it all the time. Uh, mine, it's almost, I forget to take it off. <laughs> and if, if I notice that the machine stopped and I was ready to pull the fabric away and the needle is down, I just use the back kick on my foot control. And that is the last, uh, the last one here. Uh, modern machines, the current interface machines have a hover, which for quilting is awesome. For garment constructions, I like to keep my foot down. And I use the freehand system to lift the foot only when I want and how much I want. Sometimes it's a nudge to just shuffle the fabric, just a hair to reposition, or it's lifted all the way up. Now, another reason to use your freehand system is that if the foot was parked up and you're doing something heavy, let's say a polar fleece, uh, you know, polar fleece garment, and at the collar it gets really heavy. If your foot is already parked in the up position and you use the freehand system, you gain an extra two millimeters of clearance. It will go further up when you push with the knee bar. So that's another uh, use for it. Not only that, if you have something delicate going on, when you use the freehand system to lift the foot, it will drop the feed dogs on even on the older machines like the 1130, the 1230, the 1530, it will drop the feed dog. So there's no more feed teeth to brush and interfere with your seam allowances and all that while you're sewing. So that's also a big plus. All right, next, number three, additional tools for success. So first, of course, is the machine. And I will give you a little hint here. Bernina has the best feed dogs on the industry. And I knew this before I worked for Bernina. It's part of the reason I bought a Bernina in the first place. If you were to take your finger and pet the teeth on your feed dog, you'll notice they're raspy without cutting, of course, but they're raspy. The feed dogs have teeth like this, but they've been cut across the top so that even forward and back, you now have two grip points as opposed to just one point. And so they grip well both ways. And they grip really, really well, which means let the machine feed. When you try to feed the fabric through, don't try to help the fabric. If anything, hold back a little bit. Don't yank back, but make the machine take the fabric from you. Do not try to feed the fabric to the machine. You'll get much better results without those layers shifting like they tend to do when you sew. If you try to feed the fabric through, you're actually helping the lower underneath, the lower fabric more than the top fabric. So just let the machine feed the fabric. You will. I start with the right, need, uh, the right needle for your fabrics. That's the key. Uh, choose your needle by fabric type. And there's a link in the handout to the five basic needles you need in the sewing room. And of course, there's more needles than that. And if you're going to sew an outfit in neoprene, you know, foamy uh, rubber, you're going to need a specific needle for that. So start with the needle type and then a needle size. And you can piece a shirt pretty much with a sharp, which we call jeans needle nowadays, but it used to be called sharp, a sharp 80. Now, when it gets to hemming and all that, uh, if it's a heavier denim, like if it's on pants, you may, you probably will have to up the size at that point. So you can use two needles of the same type to make the garment. They will still be good for the next garment, so I keep them. But I will switch needle in the middle of a project to accommodate the size requirement when I need it. And of course, if I'm going to do top stitching, I may want to go to a, uh, if it's heavy, heavy material, heavy garment, uh, I may go to a top stitch needle. Or if it's a fine blouse and I want to do edge stitch for detailing, I may go to a microtex, a microfiber needle with a super fine point to get that beautiful stitch for edge stitching. So you can change. The post that I will show you later will give you indications of what these needles are for. All right, next, 
use the right presser foot. You have an advantage, Bernina's presser foot system, and actually they just posted a video today on the history of the A, B, C's and D's of presser feet that I just finished last week. So there's that, but there's also one on how easy they are to put on and off, and I gave you tips on that video on Facebook. So if you go to Bernina International Facebook, you, there's vid, uh, in the sewing tips sections of the videos, you'll see there's uh, a whole list on the presser feet, the plates, the and all that. All right, so use the right foot for the technique. It's nice, you can change the foot right away, no screwdriver, you 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 have no excuse to not have the right foot on the machine for the technique. So, and you uh, you notice when you teach a class with mixed brands of machines, like when I teach at different uh, different shows, people who own Berninas tend to have more feet strewn around the machine when they're done with their project, and that's exactly why that is. All right, so you want to also make it to home plate. Change the plate when you have to. Uh, if you're doing delicate fabrics, you know, chiffon, charmeuse, georgette, I want to call the wicked little slinky fabrics, satin, anything like that, you don't want these fabrics to go down into the hole. Use a straight stitch plate. And you can use a matching foot, like foot number eight, for instance. So you can use that as well. So when you do, and if your machine has a safety program, most all touchscreen machines do, or the, if they have a restriction, tell the safety program what plate is on every time uh, and do it before you finish snapping the plate on so that you don't forget, all right? So remember to use your safety program. So that's the basics. Now, uh, in addition to tip number three, a note about threads. So threads, there's a myriad threads out there. You may have your favorites. I am not here to convince you to change threads, okay? But uh, consider the thread type for the thickness of your project, how many layers and so on. If you sold sales for your boat, you'll use a specific thread that's good for marine applications. If you sew an uh, uh, oiled canvas awning for your patio or for your table, your patio table, you will use a polyester thread for that because a cotton thread would get eaten by the sun, right? Would disintegrate. So you'll want, you'll want to adjust to that. I will tell you, I started with cotton thread because I was told you don't mix thread types, cotton versus, you know, cotton thread goes with cotton fabrics and so on. Uh, not so much. That's not so true. Uh, I use polyester thread mostly today, methylmetrosine, for two reasons, basically. One is that the thread is not dyed after it's made like a cotton thread. It is the resin is composed with that color and it is ready to go. So the, it will not discolor over time. Your garments that you buy are sewn with polyester thread and most of the times they don't really pop stitches. You know. The other one is that if the if this goes outside, like if it's an outdoor application, polyester thread is sun tolerant, so it will not it will not be degraded by the sun like a cotton thread. But uh, and also uh, thread types, there are two ways to wind a spool. Originally, it was a cross wound method. So this is cross wound. You know, you remember Coates and Clark. Uh, this is Madeira bobbin thread. The st the thread is stacked one round um, on top of the other. If you have such a thread you should use a vertical spindle on your machine. Vertical spindles, like on the new 5 Series, they pop up. For a long time, the last 20 years, we've had them either swivel up or snap on for like the Artista 200 and before, 730 and before, right? So those uh, those vertical spindles are for this, and you want to use the little foam pad that has a plastic base that rotates freely so that you don't have whiplash going on with your spool. I learned that early on, my first year at Bernina. If there's a whiplash, if there's a tug on your thread, especially vertical thread, like verticals and stack thread. If you have a tug here, one gram of tension added here is five grams of tension added at the needle. That's enough to lead a crooked stitch, a puckered stitch, an irregular stitch. So you want to make sure your thread flows freely. Uh, more uh, after that, thread became cross wound. So if you look at this, this thread is cross wound, so it crisscrosses. There's more mechanics at winding the thread at the factory, right? But this gives you free thread delivery it unspools more easily. So if it's a big spool, you can use a thread stand on the outside and then you know fly it right into the machines like you, like you normally thread. Otherwise, this goes on the uh, spool. If you use Aurafil, for instance, that little small core that you see here, this is matched exactly to the size of the tiny little spool cap that you have. I tend to use the medium spool cap and I use it in the concave position against the spool because this way it becomes a squirrel guard. The thread cannot go and gets itself snagged underneath. So that's for that. So you have cross wound. Cross wound thread should be delivered horizontally and stack thread vertically. I use poly polyester thread mostly. It's my personal choice. If you are using, let's say, Mettler 50 weight silk finish to make your garments, you like it. It's predictable. You know exactly how it works. 
don't change anything. If it works, it's perfect, right? So don't change anything. Next, machine adjustments. Now, we could go into a whole day of you know, playing with adjustments, but to, uh, to cover some of the basics, presser foot pressure. Uh, if you have polar fleece and it's really heavy, polar fleece is squishy. So if you have really a high presser foot pressure on this, when the machine tries to feed the bottom, it will squish laterally. And your, your, your fabric, your two layers may not want to move, even with dual feed. You may need a walking foot at that point. A tip with heavy, spongy fabrics, fleece, sweat fleece, polar fleece, that kind of thing, lighten up the presser foot pressure. Then they will allow those layers to not squish as much and to go through. Your hems will not wave as much as well. Uh, all machines since 1997, since the Artista 180 and the Activas and Virtuosas, all machines, uh, well, after the Activas, so the vir uh, Virtuosas and up, have a pressure foot pressure adjustment. Some of them, the touchscreen machines, uh, have it uh, today on the screen. Uh, the early touchscreen machines, like the 180, 200, 730, they had it uh, on the end. When you pass the needle, there's a little mechanical knob there that you would click, 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 and it has a default position on the bottom. Remember to put it back when you change it for an application because it's mechanical, it will stay that way. Machines like Aurora, uh, uh, the mechanical, uh, no, sorry, computerized, but push button machines, they have a knob past the hand wheel, just below the hand wheel, they have a knob there that you can mechanically uh, tweak your balance if you have to. So that's one thing you can do there. Uh, I will show you uh, how to change the balance on a simulator, and that is done with, let me go to my simulator here. And I'm using the Bernina 435, so what I call the little baby Bernina of today, the baby touchscreen machine, uh, which means all the touchscreen machines made today up go like this. But this, the concept is similar on a 200 and 730, uh, for instance. So if you if you have a stitch like a straight stitch, or let me give you a stitch that's more uh, obvious, let's say a honeycomb stitch. You know sometimes it doesn't go back into the exact holes because you're sewing a hem, let's say, on a spongy squishy fabric. So what you do is you go to the functions or the balance, whichever way your machine does it, which means go back to your manual to find out where that is, right? So if you go to the balance, you can actually adjust, and on all touchscreen machines, the beauty of this is that what you do is you, you tweak here until it looks on the screen exactly like what you just sewed out. So you sewed out, you said, oh, that's not right. So you make it look on the screen just like it did on your sample, it's, it's corrected then you can go to the sample. So what you want to do with scraps, with like polar fleece, sweat fleece, knits that are prone to stretching a little bit, you'll want to run the balance test first, and then you can, when you hem, you can actually use that balance adjustment. So that's really nice. You can save this on the personal program, and it will, the balance will be pre-corrected next time you want to use that stitch. So that is for correcting balance. It's very useful. The personal program, I just mentioned, if you do a you know, top stitch with a triple stitch, a certain length, balance correction on denim for, you know, when you do overalls or whatever. And I, this is a, my friend Haley who does, oh, likes overalls. You could actually do it that way, right? You can save it. So that whenever you go back to the same fabric, like if you do your shirts in the same fabric all the time or your blouses, you can actually save a stitch pre-configured with pressure foot pressure, balance, anything you needed to do on it, stitch length, everything. It will be ready for you the next time. So that's for that. Now, this, I just mentioned the straight stitch. Your straight stitch, and I learned this early, early on, and especially with quilting, but also for shirt making. Uh, when you have a basic cotton and you have the right needle, let's say a sharp 80 or a sharp 70 needle, let's I sew a shirt with a sharp 80. Uh, you have your cotton um, uh, a 50 weight or your polyester 60 weight thread. You need to calibrate the stitch length. So let me show you, because the machine's boots at a stitch length of 2.5, it's actually a little too long for a shirt or a blouse. Uh, it's, it would be okay on a medium to heavyweight denim, but not on a shirt or blouse weight material. So I'll show you a little video now that will show you how to calibrate your stitch length. So let me show you that. To calibrate my stitch length for this fabric, this happens to be a muslin, it could be shirt fabric, it could be lightweight trousers fabric, it could be quilting fabric, it doesn't matter. I'm going to just simply run down this swatch, it's about uh, six inches long, 
I'm starting at 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance because that's typically what patterns do. But if your pattern calls for a quarter inch, if it's quilting, if it's a half inch for whatever application, use what you are going to use when you actually stitch the project. I don't need to start right at the edge of the fabric because I'm really looking at the inside here what the regular stitch will do. I'm going to put my machine on a moderate speed. My stitch length is marked on each swatch so I can tell them apart later. And this is 1.0 on the stitch length. So I'm going to sew this down at a moderate speed. And you can tell this is very short. At the end of each row, I cut. Now I know that stitch length 1.0 is rarely, rarely something I would use. So once I press this, you can tell the stitch is very short. So what I'm going to do next is simply run the other samples at similar fashion and I'm going to change my stitch length each time and we'll come back when I have all of these run through so that I can compare them. Now that I'm done stitching, let's review the samples. This is stitch length 1.0. That you can know by experience that is too short. One telltale indicator. The stitch is so short that it's pulling and gathering the fabric a little bit because there's too much thread per millimeter of fabric going in. The thread wins the tug war against the fabric. So if you see that you're seeing puckers like this and the stitches are very small, you know right away that it's too short. So we know we're not going to go there. Then 1.5. Notice there's still a little bit of puckering. So that, and then I could do the test. The test is you take the fabric and I have pressed these samples, but they have not been starched. You do not want to starch your fabric because that would defeat the test. Uh, they would all like, the fabric would all stand up equally because it is stiffened. So when you pull the fabric like this, it should cup over, but as a pretty smooth line, it should not wave too much. So that's pretty good, but I still have a little bit of gathering going on because the stitch is very short. Then I go to stitch length number two, and that looks good on the surface, so that's a good candidate. We are going to take the fabric and pull it apart. And I, you really want to use the ball of your hands so that you get a good pull. And I'm going to show it from a side. Notice that it stays upright. If I pull evenly, I don't get these tiny little ripples all over the place. The steam allowances are standing up relatively straight. So that's a good candidate, 2.0. 2.5 is what the machine boots at. And for me, that's a bit long for this type of fabric. So 2.5, I will do the rise test. So pull and see that my seam allowances, notice they're starting to wave just a little bit. I'm pulling, I promise, I'm pulling the same amount. Do you see there's like a two waves forming in there? So that is borderline. And then when I go to three, you know that three, by the time you can see the discrete stitches floating on top of the fabric, that's not going to be a very secure seam. So when I pull here, same amount of pull, do you see that it buckles? These little puckers start forming between the stitches. Do you see that? That means this stitch is too long. Now, I went all the way to four. I could have gone to five. You know that that would be exaggerated. Notice that the stitches are so long here that if I come closer, you can actually see the individual stitches kind of floating on the fabric because there's more there's more length that's needed. And again, if I pull, and now you see how it not only puckers between the stitches, but it actually buckles down right away. And if you would look at the front side, there's another confirmation. When you do this, you would see that your stitches, I used red thread on purpose, they start showing. Now, if a garment is going to be subject to wear heavy wear, like a pair of pants, you typically shorten the stitch, like in the crotch line, or same around the arm size seam of a, of a blouse or a shirt, because those are stress areas. And if you have more stitches per inch, you have more load bearing stitches per inch. Therefore, each stitch is subjected to less stress. So two look good, 1.5 was still a bit puckering, and I told you earlier that 1.75 is the one I used. Now this is a Mettler 50 weight cotton thread. This is not really what I piece with, this is coarser. So it's going to show uh, stress on the fabric a little more than m what I use in Metrocene 60 weight wood. But when I pull this, notice if, if the seam allowance goes flat down in one solid smooth slab, 
that is the ideal. That means there's no puckering between the stitches. So that's why I use 175 for this type of cotton. That with a 70 jeans slash sharp needle for quilt piecing, for instance, or for shirt and blouse making. That will do the trick. If you plan on going over hands, cross seams and all that, you may want to use a size 80 needle sharp again for basic cottons. So that's how you test the stitch length for the fabric, the thread and needle you are using. Okay, so that was for calibrating the seam. And you do this once for this kind of fabric, like quilters, you know, it's the same cotton all the time. If you use the same kind of same weight of shirting fabric for, uh, you know, the work you normally do, you can keep the swatch that work and put a, you know, even a card be behind it and write your notes then you know what to go back to, okay? Uh, you can also, uh, if you watch one of the videos on Facebook, you, on long-term memory, you can actually reprogram the default on your straight stitch when your machine boots to be the 175, the two, the whatever you'll need for your actual projects. So that's for calibrating the seam. Now, key press of feet. Uh, you could use 20 press of feet on a garment if you get fancy, but basically this is the stuff I've used all the time. Number one, and I, I list the three versions depending on what machine you have, right? If you have a five millimeter, five and a half millimeter wide machine, you'll need it'll be you'll have the foot. This comes with a machine anyway, one C and one D. All right. Um, it, I use number eight and eight D a lot. It's a straight stitch foot, which means it gives you really good control of the fabric. This is very good also for fabrics like chiffon, charmeurs, very slinky fabrics. Talking of presser foot pressure, on those very slinky fabrics, you may want to increase presser foot pressure sometimes. The nice thing about the computerized touchscreen machines, uh, uh, basically anything from the four series up and the older five series is, uh, uh, no, actually the five, from the current five series up, and four series, when you boot the machine, if the pressure foot pressure is electronic on your machine, it's on the touch screen, then on those, you your machine will boot and reset the pressure foot pressure. If it's a mechanical knob, wheel, anything, make sure that when you're done, keep it posted to something so you reset manually because you have to do that manually. The beauty of this though is that you have control over your pressure foot pressure. That's a, that's a big plus. Uh, foot number 10 for edge and top stitching, but especially for edge stitching, it's great. And 10D, uh, I've noticed that 10D, there's a benefit I did not expect, so it's free gravy. Uh, what it does is when you follow an edge with the blade, you know, and the guide in the middle of the foot, that dual feet in the back helps keep that lined up and keeps it helps you track that edge as well. It keeps it lined up because if you do this with the fabric on the front, it tends to do this a little bit at the blade, the other guide, and then you sometimes, whoops, it wants to deviate a little bit. The dual feed helps prevent that. So that was a nice benefit I discovered. Um, I've used 37 foot because if I wanted a quarter inch top stitch, like on a, on a, you know, on a, on a shoulder seam, I like a top stitch, I could actually use the 37 quarter inch foot. It works great for that too. So that's another plus. Uh, for zippers, of course, you have 14, 14 D and uh, you have 35 for invisible zippers. Those would be the ones you uh, use more commonly. For the buttonholes, you will have the uh, either manual or automatic buttonhole foot that goes with your machine. If your machine has, let's say a 215, does not do fully repeatable automatic buttonholes. It does you know, the four legs and you kind of have to walk it through. There is foot 3B that you can use for that. It looks like the automatic foot without the automation, but it has the nice fabric control surrounding the area of the buttonhole to help guide the fabric through the process without any distortion. So 3B is your ticket. If you have a more entry level machine, you can get the same fabric control and quality of buttonholes. You just don't have the automation, that's all. So uh, quality being the first thing. Of course, blind hems are done with foot number five. And if you want a hem that we have like six, I think six hemming feet in the 60 series. Uh, if you were to only buy one for like regular cottons, shirt hems, you would buy 63. Because 63 can hem around curves. None of the others do. The hemming feet do this double turn of the fabric. They have a straight channel underneath so that you can't, if you do the, the hem like this, your foot will bump against the hem, it will refuse to turn. 63 has a taper at the back of the foot that allows you to steer 
around curves and do that curve shirt hem if you need to. It's only three millimeter wide, so it's about an eighth of an inch wide when you're done double turning. If you need something longer, you'll need to, do, uh, like wider rather, you will need to do a straight hem and do that. But you have multiple options, even for scalloped edges on knits, if you want to do like tricot, lingerie, stuff like that. So uh, when you go to the Bernina.com for each individual foot, there is information on what it does, so you can actually look it up there. Now, there is a little foot here called non-stick straight stitch foot number 53. You remember the old, old, old machines, like the my, my grandma's machine? It had a foot that had a big toe and a little toe. Actually, the big toe was kind of narrow like this and a little toe. So the foot is narrow and it has this straight stitch opening and it's very narrow. I, I would not use that foot for regular seaming of my garment. But when it came to like really tight curves, when I had to do high cap sleeves, like on women's blouses, the foot is narrow, so it steers better around that. Uh, like a big nine millimeter foot on a tight curve, you're talking trying to drive a three quarter ton truck in a little path, right? It's hard to turn around that way because there's so much surface to turn around. But the narrow skinny foot like this, it will it, think of almost like a um, uh, snowboarding it will follow the curve better that way. So I've used a uh, number 53. We used to have a number 13, which was in not non-stick, regular plain metal version. But when a foot doesn't sell anymore, rather than force the stores to carry unnecessary material, we combine to simplify. So now there's only one foot and it happens to be non-stick at the same time. So you get two benefits in the one foot. So that's four. And if you have dual feed on your machine, if there's a 1C and 1D for my 880, my 790, even my Artista 200, well, no, that's just a C. But if there's a C and D version for my machine, I will tr use the D version first. You just have that extra tra traction for more even results. So I will keep using that. Now, if you have feet, and this, this is a shameless plug division. I have a little love for this book because when I approached Bernina with a project that was equivalent to this, I did not write this book. It was being written already. But uh, I, you know, this is my first love. This is how I, fa I fell in love with Bernina. When I saw what all the feet did, at first I thought it was like, wow, that's a nice gimmick. There was like 60 press of feet on the wall. And then when I started sewing, I realized, uh-huh, I totally get it now. Uh, I'm a, I was a convert before I worked for Bernina. But this will do two things for you. If you have 10 feet already, it will allow you to get the full advantage, full benefit of everything you bought and you, know, you paid for. That's my philosophy. I want you to benefit from what you paid for. So everything. But it will also tell you, for this technique you're doing today, there's a foot that's designed just for that, like hemming shirts. You, do you want to double turn the fabric by hand twice around the curves? Not easy. And then try to sew it by hand. You're going to get that jaggedy curve, right? Where foot 63 will, if you take your time, will sail right this, you know, very smoothly. So I'm a convert. And uh, that would be for the big book of feet. You can get information about it on Bernina.com, but I will show you on We All Sew. If you don't know We All Sew, it's We All Sew one word, dot com, our blog. There's an article by Susan Beck, who is probably the world's expert on press of feet. She's the one who interviewed me when I was hired by Bernina, and she knows her press of feet A through Z. She even teaches a class called that. So that uh, do yourself a favor, check out the big, big book of feet. Now, notions I use all the time. There's way more than that in my sewing room, but we don't have time for that today. So uh, I do not pin pattern pieces down. They, uh, you know, the, pa the paper may rip if you have to reuse it all the time. I use pattern weights. You can move them as you want. And actually, I like, I used to have the, the round ones with the spikes, not good on silk. But uh, nowadays, the soft ones, the nice thing about the soft ones is they spread the pressure when you put them down and they give you a very good result. So you, uh, I would recommend you use pattern weights. And uh, scissors, I have shears, of course, for big cuts. But if I had only one pair of scissors, in my sewing room, it would be the these are gingers, the five inch. They used to be called Taylor's Point. Okay, those of you who've been sewing garments for a long time, you're gonna wink right now. Taylor's Point. People don't tailor anymore, so now they call them craft knife edge scissors. They're the same. The beauty of these scissors, and I have a picture of them here, is that they are short enough and small enough and pointy enough that you can clip seam allowances when you have to in very tight areas and cut the corner across the corner of a a color point tip and do a nice clean cut. They're super sharp, knife edge, that's the key. And then they, they do a very good job of tiny little things, but they're strong enough that you could slash through a yard of leather 
and they're strong enough to do that. So if I had only one pair of scissors in my sewing room, these would be it. Okay, pins in moderation. I sew without pins, and I'll show, I will do a video one day about that. But uh, I use Wonder Clips a lot because you can pinch and slide them off; they don't disturb. Pins actually can interfere with your precision. So uh, if you don't use Wonder Clips yet, there's these little guys here. There ought to be a Nobel Prize for sewing, and the Wonder Clips would win it. Okay, uh, these are called Snippies. That's a brand. There's Easy Cut, another brand. Havel is a brand. Uh, there's a Tulip Pink version as well. They're all good. They're surgical steel, and they're curved like this at the tip. There used to be sharp ones and very curvy ones, and a few years ago they converged to a moderate curve. These will shave. If you do top stitch, you end. There's a little tail of thread left. These will shave a thread right off the edge of the surface of your fabric. You won't even know it was ever there. So, and because they're pinched by your fingers, they are they maintain your dexterity. You can go and pinpoint a stitch. I use them mostly for embroidery, but I use them for sewing. I have the old Ginger one hand grab and clip snips, but I find that these are easier. I don't have to get my finger in the, into the loop hole. I can just go and snip. So I like those. And for fray blocking, there's you know the famous brand. Uh, I won't mention it. <laughs> it tends to leave a glassy residue behind that's visible. This is the magic stuff. Fray block by June Taylor. I don't own stock in the company. I don't get commission. <laughs> but this is very liquidy. Uh, you want to stabilize the cut button holes after you cut them. You want to uh, stabilize you know the end of a seam that may be exposed. This is the ticket. You can do it from the wrong side. And it's liquidy. It disappears. You can press over it. It does never lose, never looks wet or glassy. It does not leave a visible spot. Uh, a little note: it's very liquidy. I said right three times. Do not squeeze the tube. It will, it'll cry. It will squirt on you. You don't want that. Let it seep. Let it drip its own drop, and it will do its job. So, uh, fray block is the magic stuff. It's really, really well done. And the June Taylor products are usually well researched for that reason. That reason. Okay. Next. I'm going to show you the useful links. These are all in the handout that you have, and they're all clickable in the PDF. Now, your computer may have a security setting that will say, uh -uh, you can't click you know, your PDF reader, whichever whichever application you use, may stop and say, are you OK opening you know, an external website, all that? Just say yes. Uh, I verify the links. They're clean. So they, you will go over uh, the needles, plates, and, and a bunch of stuff. So let me show you what those are. They are right here. So this is the big book of feet on we also, and you'll see there's a whole bunch of information about it. It is, th that is the book of feet. We now have one for embroidery. We have one for surging. Uh, they're all excellent. And Susan Beck used to be our editor at Bernina. She's semi-retired. So now she's basically a contractor with Bernina. We're lucky to keep her close because she is the world's expert on burning a press of feet. So uh, a, a big shout out to Susan. Uh, one of the links in there will be the, the five needles I use in my sewing room and why. So it goes through embroidery and all that stuff, sewing, uh, top stitching and all that. Uh, I mentioned in this article that I do not sew with universal needles. It's a compromised needle. It is a little bit compromised. You know, a sharp needle will be better than the sharp aspect of a universal and a ballpoint needle on a knit will be better than a universal needle but i always keep universal needles in my sewing room because they are my fallback they're a good compromise so if i oops i ran out i don't run out of needles very often anymore because i buy them by the gross but if i run out of a ballpoint needle well i can fake it with a, a universal needle so it's not that it's bad it's just that it's a compromised needle so i'd rather have the dedicated types and it's all explained in the article okay uh the stitch plates, machines have either two or three. If you have a nine millimeter machine, a wide machine, you'll have three plates available to you. If you have a five millimeter machine, like a 1260, you, know, you only have access to two plates. Uh, if you do a blind hem, your stitch swings about four, four and a half millimeters. Use the five and a half millimeter plate for that, even on an 880. You support the fabric around the area where the stitch bombardment will take place, where the needle will poke at that fabric. There is no distortion, whatever you're doing. So uh, this this uh, this uh, article will explain why you want to use the different plates. Next, the freehand system. I'm talking to the 40% of you now, <laughs> not talking to all y'all. Uh, here, this will explain how to do it, why you want to, the foot control on the left, there's a video demonstrating it and all that. Uh, 
I put one on hemming because hemming is where some people are afraid. So there's lightweight fabric hemming where you don't want bulk in the hem. You don't want to double turn the hem. There is the uh, double, the single turn hem for like uh, 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 denim, for instance, if you don't want the bulk. And if you're doing jeans, for instance, you want a double turn hem, there's that as well. So that will explain all of that. Um, I show, gave you a link on garment related projects on We Also. And bonus, our webinar host today, Megan, she is one sharp seamstress. Megan is 23. She just turned 23. She's been in fashion shows, okay? She is that good. She knows her garments. So, uh, whoops, actually, I, uh, th so if you go there, you'll see links. There's a, a garment so along in multiple parts that Megan did. So it'll be a good review. You may pick up tips on how to you know, leverage your equipment. So that's really, really good. And then there's a link to uh, Bernina USA on Facebook. You'll want to subscribe because when we add a video, like today is on the history of the feet, uh, you will be notified. There's stuff on surging, there's stuff on the TLC for your machine, how to oil, there's a whole bunch of videos in there. And there is a section on sewing tips that you will see, I think I have it here. So there's a session on sewing tips, and this is the one, there's a link to the foot control, how to use it to best advantage. So that is for uh, the links in your handout. Uh, Megan, I think we did not run the initial polls on what type of garments people are sewing. So let's put that up. Okay, can do that. And while we put that up, uh, if you have questions now, fire away. Megan will be, uh, will be reading through them and then passing them on. The poll is multiple choice, so I know garment makers tend to be very, uh, you know, very multiple choice because we tend to sew a whole bunch of stuff. And I have to say, beginning with garment sewing was the best sewing school for me. Uh, not that quilting would not be a good sewing school, but garment, you have to deal with curves, layers, and trimming, and zippers. Basically, the only thing not in the program is the kitchen sink, right? So it's a very, very good sewing school. So I'm very grateful I started that way. Uh, Megan, can, are you able to see the questions at this point? Um, yes, I can see a few of them if you want me to ask you. Yeah, yeah, let's go, let's go for it. Okay, so we did have a couple of questions. Um, for zippers, what advantage does the 14 foot have over the number four foot? Oh, okay. Uh, it's, uh, it's very similar, uh, for, 14 being the more recent style, it's centered. Uh, it, uh, you, I, you know, I only use 14 nowadays. If you have four and it works for you, I would say if you know how to use it, you know, it's like how to ride the bicycle, keep using it. But next time you go to the store, it's this is best visualized. So have them show you 14 in action so that you can verify. You may decide that four still works for you. Uh, you know, that's always good. Then you can spend the money on another foot. <laughs> or if you find that 14 will do, I only use 14 nowadays because all my current machines use 14. Actually, I use 14D because it allows me to feed uh, that, that way. And for in invisible zippers anyway, I'll use 35. So it really depends. But yeah, uh, that one, whenever my philosophy with press your feet is, if you think you need the foot, go to the store, good old, you know, the old school, bring your fabric sample, and then ask them to, the store will let you try the foot before you buy it. The feet are not inexpensive. That's because they're well-made and they work really well, but it's always good to, you know, you would test drive a car before you buy it. You want, you want to test drive the foot as well. Awesome. Um, and I did just close the poll. We had 57% said they show, sew shirts and blouses. 40% um, do pants and shorts. 51% for skirts and dresses, 32% for vests and jackets, and then 37% said other. So cool, cool. Very yeah, that's, that's pretty there. much. Yeah, it shows a variety. Yeah, you know, it's, I have a funny anecdote. My mother, who sewed, uh, you know, she she sewed for. She didn't teach me how to sew. I learned from a colleague in in uh, as an undergrad. But I sewed shirts, and she said, "Oh, you didn't start easy, did you?" And I was, and she sewed pants. Okay, and to me, pants are harder. You know. Uh, you know, the well pockets and the yoke in the back and the zipper, the cross seam and all that. And it's because I learned with shirts first. It's what you know, right? She thought shirts were hard. <laughs> so anyway, mm -hmm. uh, do we have more questions? Um, yeah, we have. I, I'll ask you two more. How about that? Um, okay. We had someone ask, do you prefer the 5.5 millimeter stitch plate or the 9 millimeter stitch plate for garment sewing? 
Okay, uh, you know what? If I sew my regular seams here, plain cotton, I until I'm ready for top stitching or edge stitching, like on the shoulder seam and on the edge of the plaquette, I will put the straight stitch plate on. You know, it's uh, it, it's guaranteed. Now, oh, one thing, going back to this shirt, there's, there's stories within the shirt. I don't wear the shirt anymore because people, it's too big. <laughs> but I use a stitch length of 1.25 on this shirt. It's a core chambray. This shirt cost me $4, right? It was a core chambray. I like the texture because it showed. But then by doing a one, and Susan at the interview asked me, how did you do this? I, I tested my stitch length. And with a stitch length of actually one, it was between 1.25 and 1.5. And by doing that, the stitch, the needle was good, jumping every warp and every weft thread in the fabric. So you don't see the individual stitches. It looks like a straight, a, seam, a, a seamless seam line. It's just a white line. And she was curious when she saw that. I've never done that again. It worked on this fabric, but that was the fun of it. So by using a straight stitch plate on my regular seams, uh, I would, I don't need a wide opening when I do the straight seaming. And so and for garments, if you put a five and a half millimeter, you can do a really good straight stitch. And then when you do like the hemming and all that, you don't need to stitch, so you don't need to change the plate. So that way it's efficient for you. That would work. Uh, if you're doing lightweight, like silk for blouses, I did a rayon microfiber oh, possessed fabric. It was evil. <laughs> I use a straight stitch plate. I had to sew on paper to not pull runs in the fabric, right? So straight, this one, I threw everything I could at it, but everything was available. But on a regular cotton like this, or a lightweight, a shirtweight denim, the five millimeter plate would work just fine. If, if it's lighter than, if it's a lightweight shirting type material, I would use a straight stitch plate. It works for quilters, right? It works for shirt makers. So it's, uh, remember, the machine doesn't care that it's a, sh a shirt versus a quilt. It just, it will do its thing. The fabric may yield, so the plate will prevent it from yielding. And the article on We Also About the Plates will give you more details about that. Awesome. Um, and then you, when using the 63 foot for rolled hands, yes. how do you negotiate the seams there? Um, how do you prevent that okay. get, from getting hung up? Okay, a couple of things. First, the startup point, right? Uh, the video on YouTube, if you go YouTube, Berlin International, and you say foot 63, the, the video from the factory, uh, shows there's three different ways to start you know, into the scroll. There's a diagonal stitch. I tried that, didn't work so well for me. I do the one the factory does. Basically, I put the foot at the edge of the fabric. I sew about a half an inch in, and then I pull off. And then I use that because the 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 by using the edge of the foot, the seam line I just put on that fabric is right at the edge of the scroll. So that will force the fabric to go into the scroll and go with it. So that's for starting. And typically you uh, you go and when you get the cross seam, if you know if they were felled, I, when I felled the seams at the bottom, before I reached the bottom, I used my little tiny scissors that I showed you, and I trimmed the seam allowance. And with the way you trim the seam allowance, so the seam line is here, the seam allowance is standing up here, right? I trim rounded in just like this, so there's no square corner to show where I trim, but I trim right flush with the seam allowance, so that when I go through the seam allowance with the double turn of the foot, it does not have to deal with bulk. And then I will do this right into, uh, right next to the plaquette and do the plaquette after, because the plaquette you can sew in reverse and flip, and then it's flush with the bottom. I do not try to double roll a plaquette. There's no way to do that. Uh, so that, that's how I do the, the hammer allowances. But the foot 63 video, there's a whole family of hammers. So when you get to 63, you'll see the startup point, which helps a lot. Cool. Um, one quick one, I know you'll have a quick answer to this. How frequently okay. do you change needles? Oh, <laughs> you know, we had a machine come at the, at the, at the office, the National you know, uh, Technical Center. Uh, the lady complained we didn't return it because her husband had been filing that needle for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> the technicians were shaking their head. Um, I change, okay, if I just did, uh, let's say I use a Microtex needle, like the article, and we also will say Microtex needle uh, to do the, the top stitching or the edge stitching on the plaquette to get that beautiful stitch. It's not worn. I'll keep it on my tomato, you know, my little tomato, and I have the markers. I've written the size of the needles and M for Microtex, so I can use it again. If the shirt is a jeans, sharp, 80, and I've sewn the whole shirt with it, I'm done, I, I, every project. 
for the, you know, I don't, uh, my other shirts did not cost $4 to make. <laughs> my silk shirts and my linen shirts cost more like 15, 20 bucks, right? So uh, I will, uh, a needle was about a dollar a needle, $1.25, you know, at five bucks for a pack back then when I made those shirts. Why would you, uh, uh, why would you, uh, you know, attack your silk to save a dollar on a needle? I will change the needle. And if I scrape the needle in by putting the stitch blade on because I was not careful, whatever, I don't take chances. I, you know, I will change the needle. When in doubt, change the needle. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Go. Well, I think we can end questions there. Um, if you do have further questions, they can email me and I'll pass them on to you, Celine. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us today. Remember to sign up for Bernina International on FaceTube, uh, FaceTube, Facebook, <laughs> and on YouTube. <laughs> That was a that was a that was a, a shortcut, <laughs> and uh, you, you'll get notified when new stuff is added. And the Bernina International, one word, no space, YouTube channel. I watch it on my 65-inch TV or on my Roku. So I have my tutorials. I want to show a machine that size, by the way. But uh, you can actually sit and learn. You know, when I'm tired, I will sit and learn. So make sure you sign up. It will help you pick up tips uh, because you know uh, a straight stitch on a sewing machine, whether it's a 215 or an 880, is the same. So uh, I hope this was helpful to you. Uh, we have more videos coming just about every week, right? So uh, see you around and happy sewing. Yep, thank you.